This is the 75th lecture that the Becker Library has sponsored for this ongoing series uh, of talks on the history of medicine. Uh, we're very thrilled to have a fantastic speaker this afternoon, who is Dr. Kristen Kearns, Assistant Professor in the Department of Preventive and Restorative Dental Sciences and the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, I met Dr. Kearns uh, back in the summer of 2017. Uh, she traveled here to St. Louis to research one of our collections here at the Becker Archives. Uh, and it was at that time that I learned more about the very interesting work she was doing, uh, studying the influence of the sugar industry on health policy. Uh, in addition to our facility here uh, in St. Louis, Dr. Kearns, um, she's visited several archival repositories around the country to identify connections between scientist and the sugar industry. And I'm going to purposely avoid explaining exactly what those connections are, as I don't wanna reveal any spoilers for her presentation. Uh, Dr. Kearns is gonna talk more about uh, herself and her work and her findings in just a minute. Uh, but without going into too much detail, I will say that she has uncovered a number of interesting documents in the archival collections that she has researched in the past decade or so. I would also like to say that what she has done with her findings is quite interesting as well. Uh, in this talk, Dr. Kearns uh, is going to highlight the Industry Documents Library at UC San Francisco, and she has encouraged institutions like our own to partner with them, where we now have one of our own collections from the Becker Archives is fully accessible online via the Industry Documents Library. All this month, Becker Library has been sponsoring a series of talks uh, and educational sessions that we call Open October to highlight trends in open science, open data, and open access. And I think Dr. Kern's work, and especially her work with the Industry Documents Library, which brings greater exposure to the many ways in which public health can be influenced and has been influenced in the past. It's a very fitting uh, with our Open October theme. I'd like to turn it over now to uh, Dr. Kearns to share her screen and her video and begin her talk. Uh, we are gonna have a question and answer session uh, at the end. And I do encourage you to use Zoom's Q&A feature at the bottom of your screens to ask questions. Uh, once again, thank you to all of you in attendance. Uh, and thank you so much, Dr. Kearns for being our 75th Historia Medica lecturer. Thank you so much, Stephen. I'm hoping you can hear me right this second. Bear with me as I get my screen sharing worked out here and get my camera turned on. Okay, can you all see me, hear me and see my slides? Is that, yes, hopefully. Great, okay, I can see in the chat. Okay, well, it's, it was so fun to get the email from Stephen and the invitation to uh, sort of come full, full circle after visiting the archives there and um, continuing to do my research at UCSF and being able to share some of the findings from this project that's been a big part of my life for the last going on 10 years now. So I am at UCSF, as Stephen mentioned, but I do want to give you a little bit of background on how I went from being a dentist to, to being somebody that hunts around in archives for sugar industry related material. And let's see if I can advance my slides. Hold on one second here. There we go. Okay, so back in 2007, I was attending a dental conference up in Seattle, and it was about the links between gum disease and diabetes. Uh, patients with type 2 diabetes more often have periodontal disease. So dentists have a real interest in understanding the links between these two diseases. And so this conference was all about that topic. And I received this brochure from a representative from the Centers for Disease Control and our National Diabetes Education Program. And I flipped it open and noticed that the diet advice said this, it said type two diabetic patients should increase their fiber, 
limit saturated fat and salt. And that's what would help control blood glucose, blood pressure, and cholesterol. But there was no mention of reducing sugar consumption to manage type two diabetes. And I thought that that was a little unusual. And then we had a second keynote speaker who handed out his fast food guide to nutrition. And I flipped open to this page of drinks and noticed that Lipton Brisk sweet tea with 44 grams of sugar was given a green light. And I was pretty, pretty surprised by this. So I actually jumped up out of my seat and chased down the speaker who was trying to leave to catch his flight and confronted him and you know, said, how can you possibly characterize this as a healthy drink? And his response to me was that there is no evidence linking sugar to chronic disease. And I was literally speechless. We were at a dental conference in my mind, I'm thinking tooth decay, which we call dental caries, is the number one chronic disease in children. This is a picture of rampant tooth decay in a young child. You know, how could he possibly say there's no links between sugar and chronic disease? Uh, but that was the end of our conversation. He left and went out the door, and I was a little flummoxed about what I had learned at this dental conference. So I went home and got curious. I started to wonder, had the sugar industry somehow impacted what I was hearing about diet advice related to sugar at these conferences? And so again, it was back in 2007, and I just did some internet searching. And I came across the website for the Sugar Association, which is the trade group based in Washington, DC, which represents the cane and beet sugar companies. And this is a screenshot from their website back in 2007. And here they're boasting that 1,000 scientific papers had dispelled the links between sugar, diabetes, hypertension, and behavior problems and obesity. And then they were citing government reports from the FDA, as well as reports from the National Academy of Sciences, which had supposedly exonerated sugar from having negative health effects. And again, I was just astounded and couldn't really believe what I was seeing. So. I wanted to know more, you know, who is this trade association? What are they doing? What are they up to? You know, what papers are these? What about these government reports? And I started collecting materials on the internet, but also at public libraries. And I was back in Denver, Colorado at this time. And I went to my local Denver public library and was typing in sugar into the, the library catalog and records to the Great Western Sugar Company popped up. And the Great Western Sugar Company had been based in Denver. They were a sugar beet company. Colorado grew sugar beets all up and down the front range of the state. And this company actually went out of business in the late 1970s and they donated many of their records to local libraries like Colorado State University where they had uh, in their finding aid some references to nutrition and policy. So I was pretty excited about that. And I headed up to Fort Collins to look at what they, what they had in their archives. And the very first folder that I pulled out and the first document was this one here and it had the Sugar Association with their letterhead across the top, confidential in all caps. I was very excited and knew I was onto something good here. And what I stumbled upon was uh, documentation related to the Sugar Association's award that they received in 1976 from the Public Relations Society of America. They got the Silver Anvil Award. This is like winning an Oscar if you're in the PR field. And uh, so the, the collection at Colorado State was actually a collection of pictures and they kept uh, the text, textual documents related to them uh, to give context. Sorry, I'm just checking in. I just kind of lost my screen for one second. Hold on. Okay, can you all still see my main screen? I just want to check in, so sorry. Uh, so it's not in uh, presentation view. So we're seeing okay. kind of small. Got it, let me, all right. Is it that back to it. presentation view? Okay, yeah. there we go, sorry about that. 
Okay, um, so the Silver Anvil Award found all these textual documents related to that award. And at this point, I actually had quit my job. I was had been working for Kaiser Permanente up in Oregon, and I decided that I was going to uh, dedicate myself to this. I gave myself a year to see, you know, if I, I just felt there was something here. So, there was a story here that had to get out. I ended up getting connected with a science writer, Gary Taubes, who had been looking at the evidence related to low fat or versus high carb diets. And together he and I wrote an article back in 2012 that came out in Mother Jones magazine uh, that was giving details on this public relations campaign that the sugar industry had launched. And it was all related to a Food and Drug Administration report. So in 1976, the FDA was doing a full review of all of the foods that had made it onto their safe list and sugar was one of those foods. And so the documents that I had found detailed how the sugar industry set out to influence that report uh, success, successfully, by the way. So when the sugar industry was putting in its application for the Silver Anvil Award, they described the FDA report as being highly supportive, making it unlikely that sugar will be subject to legislative restriction in the coming years. So after I had that article come out, I knew that UCSF was the place that I wanted to go. And the reason for that is mainly to do with this guy, Stanton Glantz and the work that he led having to do with the tobacco industry documents that became available in the late 1990s. First, it was a secret box of documents that arrived at Stan's door. Then it turned into a massive internet archive after uh, the discovery documents related to all the cigarette litigation was made public and made publicly available at UCSF. So they had a research program at UCSF and I wanted to come here to apply what they had learned about studying the tobacco industry to studying the sugar industry. And this is a, a screenshot of the user interface for the industry documents library for the true tobacco industry documents library. There have been over a thousand publications uh, based on the documents in this library that have impacted policy at the local, national and global levels. Now, when I arrived at UCSF, I had actually gone around and collected a few uh, document collections. I was just taking photocopies just sort of on my own. So Gary Taubes uh, had given me a little bit of money to travel to Florida and Georgia and Massachusetts, where I got some photocopies from the Hegstead collection at Harvard. Uh, there was a massive collection at University of Florida, the Braga brothers. Uh, related to Cuban sugar companies and I had corresponded at the University of Illinois and gotten records from Roger Adams who had been a chemist at University of Illinois and I showed up at UCSF with my U-Haul with boxes full of the photocopies that I'd made from these various collections coming here to start studying the sugar industry as my full-time job and uh, so I was studying this organization the Sugar Association which dates back to 1943 it has evolved in various forms and lives on now as the Sugar Association based in the US, but it has a global counterpart, the World Sugar Research Organization, which has uh, members all over the world. This is a map where all the various sugar trade groups are based and their members in the past have included Coca-Cola as well as the International Life Sciences Institute. So what I want to do from this point forward is make some comparisons between the sugar and the tobacco industry and using these categories, funding science, publishing it, suppressing it, criticizing it, getting it out into the press and getting it to policymakers. And I'm going to use some of the files from these various sugar archives to give you examples of what the sugar industry has been up to. So starting off with funding research that supports the interest group position, we can look at, this is a document from I think 1942 that's in our industry documents library now. Uh, this is an outline for what the Sugar Research Foundation could accomplish that was put together by Odie Lamborn, who is a sugar broker based in New York City. 
And they were concerned because sugar had been rationed during World War II. So sugar consumption had actually come down quite a bit. And they were very concerned that sugar consumption levels would stay at that level after the war. In particular, government nutritionists to support the rationing program had put out pamphlets saying things like, how much sugar do you need? And saying none, it was really just for flavor. It wasn't a food. You really didn't need it in your diet. And so this is what the Sugar Research Foundation was reacting to in the 1940s when it came together as a trade group. They announced their formation in 1943 in the New York Times setting up this trade group. The purpose to clarify the place in the diet of sugar and of foods and beverages containing sugar. And then a little bit more on, on their approach to funding research. So this is a document that's actually from the Tobacco Industry Documents Archive from January, 1954. And this is a letter written by Robert Hockett, who's Hockett's pictured here. And he was the Sugar Research Foundation's first scientific director. And 1954 was the year that the tobacco companies joined together with the PR firm Hill and Knowlton to form the Tobacco Industry Research Committee. And this is when the tobacco industry really got its start on casting doubt between the links between smoking and cancer. Well, Dr. Hockett uh, was out of a job. He, he was no longer working for the sugar industry. So he wrote them a letter about what he could do for the tobacco industry. And he said that he'd been part of the Sugar Research Foundation, which was formed to investigate charges that refined sugar as a primary cause of diabetes, tooth decay, polio, B vitamin deficiencies, and obesity. And that he had organized and directed research projects in medical schools, hospitals, universities, and colleges, which had exonerated sugar of most of the charges that had been laid against it. And so could it be that the sugar industry was actually up to these tricks even before the tobacco industry? Uh, and this tradition of funding research and, and casting doubt continued on. And so the 1970s, the Sugar Research Foundation renamed itself. It became the International Sugar Research Foundation. They wanted to strengthen their ties globally because misconceptions concerning the causes of tooth decay, diabetes, and heart problems exist on a worldwide basis. And another uh, clip from the Sugar Association. This is from one of their board of directors meetings where they're talking about the purpose of the Sugar Association. They're saying in confronting our critics, we try to never lose sight of the fact that no confirmed scientific evidence links sugar to the death dealing diseases. This crucial point is the lifeblood of our association. So moving on to publishing research that supports the industry's group position. Uh, we were actually able to locate a, a book uh, of sugar research that the Sugar Research Foundation published itself. And this was just sitting in a public library where they listed all of the research projects that they funded between 1943 and 1972 looking at the types of research that they funded. So they had uh, 40, excuse me, 54 projects total in these various categories, nutrition, heart disease, tooth decay, diabetes. And then the number of publications uh, that resulted from those 54 projects. So there's 224 publications during that time. And as I'm a dentist, I was particularly interested that much of their focus was on tooth decay. And then looking a little bit more closely about what their tooth decay research program was all about. This is a snippet from one of their annual reports in the 1950s. And here they're talking about the ultimate aim of the foundation in dental research has been to discover effective means of controlling tooth decay by methods other than restricting carbohydrate intake. So what does that mean? So another example from some of the research they were funding in the 1960s related to tooth decay, they were actually working together with the chocolate and confectionery industry. So it wasn't just the sugar industry. And the sugar industry's piece of this research budget was only 4%. So it was a much larger pro project overall. The sugar industry was contributing $85,000 in today's dollars. 
And they were trying to develop things like dextrinase enzymes, which it would be an enzyme that would break up the plaque on your teeth. And they wanted to add these dextrinase enzymes to foods or to toothpaste so that you could continue to eat as much sugar as you wanted, as long as you're breaking up the plaque and then you wouldn't be uh, suffering from tooth decay. The other idea was a dental caries vaccine, which we're still chasing after today, even though uh, tooth decay is actually caused by numerous bacteria and the ability to identify a vaccine for every single type of bacteria is virtually impossible. So then thinking about criticizing research that doesn't support the interest group position, what are some examples of that from the sugar industry archives? Well, for here, uh, I was looking a little bit more closely at the heart disease research projects that the Sugar Research Foundation funded. And they were particularly interested in this topic between 1965 and 1974. This is a list of those heart disease projects. So it totaled nine projects, uh, upwards of 20 plus publications, spent close to a million dollars on these projects. And I particularly honed in on uh, this first one, this literature review where they were looking at the evidence, uh, comparing the evidence that linked fat to heart disease versus the evidence that linked carbohydrates to heart disease. And I had the publication, but I also had documents going back and forth uh, of correspondence between the Sugar Research Foundation and the researchers that worked on this literature review. And so I, I had some context as to why they were publishing this work. And so this is a quote from the president of the Sugar Research Foundation back, back in 1954, where he was recognizing an economic opportunity. He said, if the American public switched to a low fat diet, this change would mean an increase in the per capita consumption of sugar by more than a third. So as recommendations for a low fat diet were gaining prominence at this time, they were getting very excited. The sugar industry was getting very excited about that because that meant increases in sugar sales. But they also noticed that more and more evidence was emerging that was linking sugar consumption to coronary heart disease in particular. And so here it's uh, Vice President John Hickson who was monitoring the, the threatening research and he's telling the, the sugar executives that from a number of laboratories of greater or lesser repute there are flowing reports that sugar is a less desirable dietary source of calories than other carbohydrates. In particular, they were concerned about Professor John Yudkin, who's a British physiologist. They also were noticing an uptick in media coverage of these studies linking sugar to heart disease. And so this is a, a clip from the New York Herald Tribune, which was a major competitor of the New York Times. And there was a big Sunday article saying briefly, it may be the sugar you eat rather than or in addition to the type of fat in your diet that increases your risk of heart attack. Up to now, the sugar hypothesis has been mainly theoretical, supported by only a few studies. So up until that time, uh, cholesterol, your blood cholesterol and its link to heart disease was the main focus. This was the biomarker of concern uh, as being the major risk factor for heart disease. But what these new studies were finding was that there, an, there was another biomarker, uh, serum triglycerides in the blood that might also be an important risk factor for coronary heart disease. And in fact, also an important risk factor for metabolic disease leading to type two diabetes. And it was this link between serum triglycerides and sugar that was emerging in the mid 1960s that the sugar industry was very concerned about. So this was the uh, motivation for the sugar industry to fund that first literature review, which they commissioned with uh, Mark Hegstead and Fred Stair and Robert McGandy at Harvard. Uh, Stair was the chair of the Department of Public Health and Nutrition at, at Harvard. And there are, Hegstead's archives contain correspondence with the Sugar Research Foundation. We were able to see that the Harvard researchers were given about $48,000 in today's dollars. I identified correspondence, 24 instances of correspondence back and forth between the researchers and the industry. Uh, 
the sugar industry received drafts of this literature review. And here's the president, Vice President John Hickson from the industry saying, let me assure you, this is quite what we had in mind and we look forward to its appearance in print. This ended up as a two-part series that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And like I said, it was reviewing the evidence linking fat to coronary heart disease versus sugar to coronary heart disease. Uh, the article did mention that some industry funding and mentioned the Nutrition Foundation, but it did not mention the sugar industry's funding. Uh, so very prestigious journal, very prestigious institution and did not mention uh, the industry funded this. So we've written a very detailed paper on this whole incident. And if you want to look at it in more detail, uh, it's definitely available. There's actually been uh, various media articles written about it as well. But we, we actually went through and looked for bias in the way that this review was structured and how did they treat the evidence linking fat to heart disease versus how did they treat the evidence linking sugar to heart disease. And they were much more critical of the evidence linking sugar to heart disease than they were of the, the fat evidence. And it's quite a complex analysis, but as you can imagine um, thinking about industry influence the way this review would go. And these leaders ended up being very influential in the world of dietary policy and dietary guidelines. Both Hegstead and Stare were involved with the original dietary guidelines in the early 1980s that really focused only on cholesterol, didn't focus on triglycerides, whereas triglycerides finally got more attention uh, much later and are now recognized as a very significant risk factor for heart disease and metabolic disease. So what about suppressing research that doesn't support the interest group position? Well, we found an example of that as well. So again, looking at the cardiovascular disease projects, uh, one of my next papers was to look at these studies in 1967 where they were comparing diets comprised mostly of starch versus diet, com diets comprised mostly of sucrose and how they impacted those blood lipids, those, those cholesterols and those serum triglycerides. And this one project in particular was interesting. It was called the effect of dietary carbohydrate load on blood lipid level in germ-free rats. And I had to learn a lot about germ-free rats and why that is an interesting thing to study. Uh, but as it turns out, I can tell you a lot about the bacteria in your gut. And we hear a lot these days about the microbiome and the influence of the gut bacteria on our health. And it really has gotten a lot more focus very recently. Well, I was quite surprised to learn that they were doing studies of the microbiome back in the 1960s and early 1970s. So in this case, they were comparing rats that didn't have bacteria in their gut, the germ-free rats, compared, compared to conventional or normal rats that had normal bacteria because they believed that this gut bacteria was somehow involved in this triglyceride effect. So if you ate sugar, the sugar interacts with the gut bacteria, which leads to this high level of trigly triglycerides, which is a risk factor for heart disease and metabolic disease. So in doing these studies, they noticed that the rats that didn't have bacteria, when you fed them a high amount of sugar, you actually saw a sharp decrease in triglycerides, which is um, opposite to what happens when you, you have a normal rat. And then uh, they also found that there was a difference comparing sugar and starch that when rats were eating sugar, there was an elevated biomarker that was linked to bladder cancer. And the sugar industry was talking amongst themselves about being quite concerned about that finding. Uh, and they also uh, in communication with the researcher who had worked on this project for, I think it was over two years, and he was running out of money at the very end. And he wrote to the sugar industry saying he was extremely close. The results were very promising. He just needed a few more weeks. And he believed that the rats showing this elevated level of triglyceride were going to uh, show that the role of bacteria in determining serum triglyceride, triglyceride levels will be proven conclusively. So he believed he was leading towards conclusive evidence that this bacteria mediated the relationship between consuming sugar and triglycerides, which could help to explain what was going on with heart disease. And the sugar industry, after funding it for two and a half years, 
ranked the value of this project to the sugar industry as nil and cut off the funding. And this study was never published. And then, like I said, here we are 40, 50 years later, really examining the microbiome and seeing uh, what an important factor it is in, in heart disease and metabolic disease related effects. Okay, now how about disseminating interest group data or interpretation of risk in the lay press? Well, uh, yes, the sugar industry definitely does a lot of work to get their message out to the media. And here's just a couple of examples. This is going back to the 1970s related to that Silver Anvil Oscar winning PR campaign. And one of their concerns was a media blitz by the Centers for Science in the Public Interest who had pr been promoting an event called Food Day which got a lot of national attention. It was modeled after Earth Day. And the idea was to bring attention to processed foods. And this particular food day in 1975 was going to bring a lot of attention to sugar and sugary beverages and the impact on oral health. And this document is just the, the front page of their public communications committee uh, response to food day and all of the various things they were going to do to get some, their opposing view out into the media. So here they're talking about placing Fred Stare, who was the, the head from Harvard University, who was consulting for the sugar industry, although people didn't really appreciate that at this time, get him on the AM American show, change the format of the Today Show, get a doctor onto PBS, have another uh, Sugar consultant Dr. Jukes interviewed out west on the television news service. They had their consultants uh, networked all over the country so that they could connect in with the regional news programs as well. And here they are putting Dr. Stair on over 200 radio stations for three and a half minutes. And this was just to counter this one event, Food Day. So imagine uh, their complex media response uh, that they had at the ready to address any type of media attention, putting sugar in a negative light. Here's a clip of uh, Food Day, which in 1975 was supported by uh, Ralph Nader, for example. And then how about presenting interest group data or interpretation of risk directly to policymakers? So for this example, I have another tooth decay example. So I wrote a paper looking at our National Institute of Health, uh, the dental part, the Dental Institute, which is called the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research. Back then it was called the National Institute of Dental Research, NIDR. And they launched a program, they called it the National Caries Program, which is the tooth decay program approved in 1970. And they were gonna halt tooth decay within a generation. And this is a clip from the New York Times. And uh, for those of you connected to public health, we often hear these proclamations, we're gonna end childhood obesity within a generation. We're gonna end this in a, in a decade. It was one of those proclamations, we're gonna end tooth decay in a decade. And they were launching this research program. Well, uh, some of the documents that I had collected, I was able to see that when I compared the NIDR task force that was developing the research priorities, to a sugar industry panel that they had convened to help inform the sugar industry's research agenda, everyone in yellow was in common with both of those committees. And so the sugar industry was basically able to develop relationships with nearly every member of the NIDR task force responsible for putting together our national tooth decay agenda in 1976. And even more than that, the, the sugar industry put together their own version of research priorities that they, shot, that, that they thought should get federal funding and be endorsed by the NIDR. And I had this research report in, in the archives. Line by line. And as it turned out about 78% of the sugar industry's report ended up in the NIDR request for proposals. And much of that was verbatim. I think almost 40% uh, was verbatim. And here's an example. So the sugar industry side, they're saying, 
but since it's not practicable to replace sucrose in our diet, can anything be added to mitigate its carrigenicity? Phosphates are a possible answer. This was another example. Phosphates you could add to foods and you could improve the pH so that foods wouldn't be so acidic and you could keep eating sugar without uh, the effects of tooth decay. This was the idea. This is what they wanted to develop. And then on the NIDR side, we have, if it is not practicable to replace sucrose in our diet, can anything be added to the diet to mitigate its carrigenicity? Phosphates are a possible answer. So here it is, word for word, uh, incorporating the sugar industry's priorities into our federal priorities. And then when I looked at what the research priorities ended up being, uh, where there was agreement between the industry and, and the federal agenda, the things like that dextrinase enzyme that I mentioned to break up the plaque, antimicrobials, antibiotics, water fluoridation, sealants, these are all strategies to control tooth decay that didn't have anything to do with diet. Dietary phosphates did make it on to the agenda. What didn't make it on to the agenda was to specifically look at uh, foods that were harmful to teeth. So this cariogenic potential of foods, that's a fancy way of saying, does a food, is a food harmful to your tooth or is it not? And the idea was to develop some sort of an objective test that then the FDA could use to say, this product is good for your teeth, this product is bad for your teeth, and actually put a label on products that can warn you that this sugary cereal you know, causes tooth decay. And that's the test that never got developed, that didn't get the focus at NIDR um, in that initial research proposal, request for proposals. And you know, that we could say that that's definitely connected to all of the interactions between the sugar industry and the leaders at NIDR at that time. And then I mentioned this report uh, earlier when I was talking about the Mother Jones article, but this is another example. So this is the, the Food and Drug Administration's evaluation of the safety of sucrose back in 1976. Uh, looking at it a little bit more specifically, which is one example, looking at the diabetes research that they cited in this report. Uh, they concluded that there were some results that suggest that long-term consumption of sucrose can result in a functional change in the capacity to metabolize carbohydrates and thus lead to diabetes mellitus. Recent reports tend to contradict this hypothesis. And those recent reports were all reports that had been funded by the sugar industry and supplied to the FDA by the sugar industry. And indeed, they, the FDA report does actually cite the Sugar Association uh, as contributing to the FDA review of sugar, is, which is kind of hard for me to even fathom. But it did happen. And not only that, that George Irving, who was the chairman of this committee, who was in charge of reviewing these foods for safety, this is a picture of George Irving and he is uh, here sitting amongst all the sugar executives that were the leaders of the Sugar Research Foundation. So I'd say he had a very friendly and close relationship with the sugar industry. That was the chair of our FDA um, committee chair for the, the review of safety of foods. So looking back at these categories, Comparing sugar industry to tobacco industry tactics, you know, I would say that there's certainly evidence that the sugar industry is acting exactly like the tobacco industry and in all of these categories, funding, publishing, suppressing, criticizing, getting information out into the press, out to policymakers. And, you know, those are mainly historical examples, but I think we can absolutely point to more current examples as well. So those are some snippets from the archives there uh, with some examples comparing the two industries. But I do want to also talk a little bit about our industry documents archive. So I'm just gonna show you a couple of screenshots from what the interface looks like for the food industry documents archive. So uh, here's the URL, first of all. And I wanted to point out, so in addition to tobacco, we have now a chemical 
library, drug, food, and fossil fuel. And these are all growing uh, month by month. It's pretty exciting. Uh, we've just launched a new uh, research program focused on chemical industry documents that's just getting off the ground. Of course, we've had the tobacco industry research program for a long time. But here's the food industry documents. So we actually launched this back in November 2018. And, you know, really this started with the boxes of papers in my U-Haul that I showed up with at UCSF. And as I was writing papers and getting some attention for the research that I was doing, we started to attract some interest from funders. I got an initial just $10,000 donation that helped me uh, fly across the country and identify more collections and spend some time digging through files. Uh, that probably was what funded me to come to St. Louis and meet Stephen and be there at, at WashU and look at uh, Robert Shank's papers. And then we got a much larger donation from the Laura and John Arnold Foundation that allowed us to develop this project that Stephen mentioned to actually move to get these documents online. And this is very different than the tobacco industry project. So the tobacco industry project, the documents came out of lawsuits. Uh, but our project was mainly identifying documents that were already housed in other libraries. So this involved uh, developing partnerships between our amazing library at UCSF and other amazing libraries across the country that would then allow us to digitize these documents and make them available uh, to anyone who wanted to research this material. Now we have, I've sort of lost count, it's over 20 food collections. Many of them are historical, but some of them are more recent. We've developed some partnerships with journalists in addition to archivists uh, who have done freedom of information requests, also some, some advocacy organizations who have done freedom of information requests to get current information about researchers who are taking money from either the sugar industry or could be Coca-Cola. Uh, there's a Global Energy Balance Network, which is a front group funded by Coca-Cola. And we've been able to collect those documents and digitize them and make them available uh, in this resource. And so, yes, yeah, so we were, I was particularly interested in the Robert Shank papers. And I, and I wanted to say, because I know he, you know, he was a, a leader at WashU. And I, I don't think that he has any nefarious connections to the sugar industry. But why I was interested in his archives in particular was because he was involved in so many influential committees related to heart disease, related to diet and heart disease, related to nutrition and health effects where uh, he was an expert uh, helping to understand the evidence and comb through the evidence and, and build some of the recommendations. And so in his files, he has all kinds of correspondence about these various committees that he sat on. And I really think these committees and understanding what they were doing, you know, who, who the, the key actors were, you know, what the relationships were with industry are still really important events that we need to sort through and think about how those various committees may or may not have been influenced by industry and how they've impacted our research focus, our dietary recommendations, all the way up through the present day. And if we look uh, just at the Robert Shank collection here, we've got, gosh, uh, over 17,000 documents from the Robert Shank collection. So that's really a lot of wonderful material to be able to look at online. And then, um, like I said, the American Heart Association was one of the things I was really interested in, his connection to that organization. And there's over 980 documents related to that organization alone. And I have not had the chance to go through and even look at these, but you know, here's one right here that I'd love to look at, this meeting of the Food and Nutrition Board related to the American Heart Association from the 1950s. This is the time when the sugar industry was definitely setting out to uh, influence these groups. So I'm sure there's a lot of interesting things to uncover by looking in these documents. So with that, I think I'm up against my agreed upon 45 minute time and I'd love to turn it back over to Stephen and, and open it up to any questions or comments or hear any feedback you might have. 
Great, thank you so much, Kristen. Um, so we have already gotten a few questions coming in through the queue. So one of them, I think that you've already touched on a bit, but maybe if you could elaborate on it for a bit. Um, we have a question about someone who would like to know a little more about how you gather all of these documents from the industry. Sure. Um, yeah, so again, uh, most of them are coming from public archives. And it was actually, it's sort of surprising to think that industry documents would end up in a public archive, in a public library, but they actually have. Uh, I'm not, you know, secretly sneaking into the Sugar Association's basement to, to find these documents. These are all publicly available documents. And the way it's happened is, you know, mainly the documents are from a time period where we wrote everything on paper. You know, we were corresponding, we we're using typewriters, you know, sending real letters through the mail. Um, many of the archives are from professors who uh, consulted for all kinds of industries. And, you know, I think that still is, it's a common practice to do that. And those professors weren't necessarily uh, working in alignment with the sugar industry per se, but they were receiving all of the materials from the sugar industry. And so Roger Adams, for example, at uh, University of Illinois consulted for the Sugar Research Foundation for about seven years. And so he got every copy of their board of directors meetings, of their financial statements, of all the research projects they were funding and their correspondence related to the research projects. So that's the kind of source. Um, there, there are some instances where it really is the sugar industry's materials in the library. So that example of Colorado State University, uh, the Great Western Sugar Company really did donate their records to various Colorado libraries. But in that case, their lawyers did screen through them, I think looking for any kind of damning material. But for whatever reason, just a few boxes related to nutrition policy made it through their screening. Uh, I think they would have liked to have kept those documents out of the public eye. Uh, some collections at the University of Florida. That was another example of Cuban sugar companies donating their records. And I think it was family members that donated those. I don't really know uh, the provenance so much there, whether they were screened uh, or not, but um, they're perhaps older, you know, coming from the 1930s and 1940s. And maybe, you know, people didn't think they're was going to be anything concerning, but there's a lot of incredible material from that time period in the 1940s. And then we just found a more recent one uh, up in Vancouver, the city of Vancouver, BC, the city of Vancouver library. And that's from the BC Sugar Company. And the BC Sugar Company had a museum where they had a lot of materials and the museum closed and they ended up donating those materials to the city library. And again, it's sort of shocking that some of that material would just be handed over to a public library, but it was. So that's, you know, that's been my main source, but then, you know, journalists now being more proactive and what they're doing is they're looking at public universities and who, whose records can be requested through the Freedom of Information Act. And they're looking at uh, correspondence between these public university uh, researchers who are taking money from the industry and they're asking for their emails, they're asking for more documentation on uh, the research that's being funded by industry. So have you been able to interview any of the academics who conducted the sugar industry sponsored research and did you learn whether or how they felt pressured to obtain particular results? Most of what I have written about has been more historical and most everyone is no longer alive. And so I haven't had the chance to interview them personally. Um, but this, you know, it still happens. It still happens today, you know, and um, there, there is, you know, constant funding pressure, you know, and I think you can, you can try and think about, you know, why, why would people in the past have taken this money? And I actually get that. I get, question asked me a lot, particularly by students, you know, why would these Harvard researchers take this money and why would they do that? And, you know, some of it is the funding pressure. It, it is very difficult to find funding for research, particularly in nutrition research. And so, you know, that certainly is a factor. Um, but it's hard, it's hard to know. It's hard to get into the head of, of these folks who were doing this so long ago. 
And someone would like to know if you have ever gotten any pushback from the food industry. They definitely know all about me. Uh, they certainly comment on any paper that I publish. I think it's really dependent on how much media attention it gets. I think that's what they care the most about uh, is if it gets a lot of immediate media attention, then they will spend more effort trying to counter what I've said. So it's actually kind of fun. I have a dental student helping me on a project this summer and she's looking at the websites of the Sugar Association and other groups like the American Beverage Association. And she's like, Dr. Kearns, look, they're talking about you here, you know, here they're trying to discount, you know, your work and all that kind of stuff. So they're, they're definitely aware. They publish blog posts, you know, they comment in the media if they're contacted, um, they're definitely aware. Uh, others of my colleagues who are kind of in the space as well have had some more personal attacks and uh, I ha thankfully haven't experienced that. Others in other countries uh, that we know and work with in the advocacy space have had some scarier stuff happen with spyware getting put on their cell phones um, and receiving some some threats from from the we think you know connected to the beverage industry. So it is interesting uh, what can what can happen in that space. So we kind of have an observation and a question tied together here. So someone noticed that um, you have documents in your depository from the U.S. Right to Know, and they find this interesting because they get their funding from anti-vaccine organizations like the Organic Consumers Association, and they were curious how you vet partners to ensure that they are promoting public health. Yeah, well, we do have a, a, a process put together by our library archi archivist, and it is available online, and you can, you can look at the guidelines uh, that they follow when they're considering which collections to include. I, I can't quote it for you verbatim, but it is publicly available. With U.S. Right to Know, you know, I think that for us, it's the documents that we're really looking at. You know, they're not... Um, giving us any editorial material or, you know, any of their papers, what they're giving us is the documents they've received from freedom of information requests uh, related to industry influence. So I think it's more about the documents. It's not so much about their own documents from the U.S. Right to Know. I, I don't know if that clarifies, um, but you could, you could look more at, at kind of our, um, acquisition policy online as well. So we have a question from someone who is curious about sugar history before World War II and the 1940s and if you've done any work with that. Um, just a little bit, you know, I know that there's much, much more history earlier than the 1940s uh, related to the sugar industry and particularly related to the topics that I'm most interested in. You know, the, the sugar industry in the U.S. dates to the 1700s. You know, it's, it's been here for a really long time. It's really connected with trade and with slavery and you know, so many important historical topics. Um, the Sugar Institute was the big trade association that predates the Sugar Research Foundation. And I don't remember the exact year that they founded, I think early 1900s, and they were broken up with an antitrust lawsuit, uh, I think in the 1920s or maybe early 1930s. And then uh, the Sugar Research Foundation was an evolution of the Sugar Institute. They had to, they were broken up. They couldn't be doing all of the things they were doing under one umbrella organization. And the Sugar Institute was also just the cane sugar industry and the beet sugar industry had their own trade groups. In the 1940s, the Sugar Research Foundation represented the cane sugar and the beet sugar companies coming together. And that particular group was particularly focused on health and they had split off other groups to be more concerned about trade and economic issues. I think there's a whole fascinating history there with much to uncover that's related to current economics and social issues and social problems. Uh, it's really, I think, just a fascinating area that so many people could look at in so many different ways. So we probably have time for one more question. So I'm just gonna take the next one on the queue here. 
And so someone is curious if you have ever come across any mentions of the British nutritionist John Yudkin and efforts to discredit his research. And he was a 1950s, 1960s researcher who identified a link between sugar and heart disease. Yes, definitely. So I actually did have one slide. I mentioned John Yudkin just briefly, uh, but yes, uh, Yudkin's work in the, the 50s and the 60s and, and the 70s was a major target of the sugar industry. He was a very vocal anti-sugar voice uh, that broke through the scientific literature and, and into the popular media. And he had popular books and um, was very effective at getting the anti-sugar and, you know, quote unquote, anti-sugar view out into the public. And so the sugar industry was very aware of him and they worked very hard to discredit him. They worked very hard to publish and fund research that would counter Yudkin's research and cast doubt on Yudkin's research. So yes, definitely. Okay, well, actually, maybe we can squeeze in one more. <laughs> so, um, were there are there also lawsuits related to sugar and adverse health events? Yeah, um, I think there's been a number of them over the years. Um, you know, it's a little different than the tobacco industry, where there's a certain small number of tobacco companies in the U.S. with a limited number of products, at least that used to be the case. Now with e-cigarettes and everything, their number of products is expanding. But with the sugar industry, although, you know, I'm just talking about cane and beet sugar, really it involves a much more diverse food industry component, you know, because sugar is in so many different products. So cereal makers have been sued, for example, for... Uh, misleading labeling, uh, or, you know, a beverage company might get sued. I think like vitamin water for sort of health washing vitamin water as being a healthy drink. Um, so they're all different companies and trade groups uh, that make up the, the sugary food and beverage industry. So it's a much bigger industry. As far as actually suing the sugar industry, the way I talk about the sugar industry, I have had lawyers contact me, you know, after um, some of my articles have come out and, and there's definitely interest in that. And as the documents collection grows and is providing a resource to kind of look at the huge length of time that they've been up to these same tactics, you know, I think it has gotten some attention of lawyers, although I haven't seen any actual lawsuits come to fruition. Okay, well, we are pretty much right at time. So thank you so much. There are still questions. So people were really interested in this and really engaged with your talk. And so we are holding another Historia Medica next month. And Stephen has thrown up a slide advertising it. So that will be on November 18th. We're going very far back in time. Um, so that one is going to be talking more about plague as opposed to sugar. But thank you so much for joining us. This was a fantastic talk and thank you everyone who came and listened. Great, thanks for having me. I appreciate the invitation.